Welcome to Coffee with Christ. Today is May 13th. It is Wednesday. We are so excited to be here with you today. We are going to be looking at Exodus chapter 21, and we are going to be looking at the law concerning violence. Yesterday we looked at the law concerning servants we, and, and uh, <coughs> expounded, um, expounded on that. There you go. So, how's everybody doing out there? Blessed? Did you guys, did you guys uh, do your challenge yesterday? <laughs> that was what to serve somebody, yeah. right? To serve somebody. So we're going to be reading at verses twelve, and we're going to go through verses twenty-seven. So Laura, did you want to go ahead and read that? Sure. Do you want to go ahead and bring your Bible with you? All right. So we, good we, morning, John and Lydia. Yes, we have our, uh, we can see our comments right here. So we see Lorenzo. Good morning, Lorenzo. Good morning. So, okay, starting at verse 12. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. However, if he did not lie in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where you may flee. But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery you shall take from him my altar that he may die whoa there what does that mean take from him my altar that means there's no forgiveness Oof. that he may die and he who strikes his father or mother shall surely be put to death talk about the funeral rules for naughty children he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. And he who curses his father or mother shall surely be put to death. If men contend with each other, and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and he does not die but is confined to his bed, if he then who struck him shall be acquitted, he shall only pay for the loss of his time, and he shall provide for him for him to be thoroughly healed. And if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he remains alive a day or two, he shall not be punished for his property. If men fight and hurt a woman with a child so that she gives birth prematurely yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished according as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if any harm follows, then you will give life for a life, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, a burn for a burn, a wound for a wound, a strike for a strike. If a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. Hmm. Wow. What, how far we've come from... from the way God deals with with violence, with murder. And uh, we, we see here the law of, of violence and murder. I'm trying to uh, find a verse here that I wanted to share. Let's see if I can find it. So it's, um, it's amazing to me how if even if you, when you strike a parent, talk about children being afraid to death literally to mm. um, curse their parents or yeah. or harm their parents well you know this is broken up in two parts from verses 12 through 14 we see the appro appropriate punishment for both murder and manslaughter and then as you read further down in verses 15 through 17 it talks about the law concerning murder uh, murder of parents now does that happen today yes it does all of it happens um 
you know, we, we spent a lot of time on this subject in, in the Ten Commandments when we talked when it talked about thou shalt not murder. So we're not going to spend a lot of time here today, but we definitely want to shed light in these two aspects. So what I wanted to do is expound on the first part, which is verses 12 through 14. And it says here, he who strikes a man so that he dies shall, shall surely be put to death. And this is the principle for capital punishment. And it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 9, verse, verse 6. And it says, whoever sheds, in, whoever sheds a man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And so we see here the, the, you know, the, the right to capital punishment. Now, thank God, in you know, some states, we, we still have the capital punishment. And this is where we get it from. You know, being a biblical, uh, being founded on biblical principles, we, we've adopted a lot of our, a lot of our law comes from the Bible. But you can see how even as we've gotten uh, more liberal and our, and our states have gotten more, we've kind of watered it down. We've kind of changed a lot of our laws and really it's, it's sad, um, but, you know, we were, we're losing, you know, uh, the, the truth. And in that, it, it really makes um, committing crime um, more violent. Uh, very very sad people are getting away with a lot of violent um, you know a lot of violence and you know even even um, you know people that come from other countries that commit violence and are not being held accountable but we see the accountability for your actions when you commit murder it, you know when you kill a man it should cost you your life he says he says uh, in the New Testament um, the right for a state to wield the sword of execution is also in, in Romans chapter 13, that's the verse I was trying to find. In Romans chapter 13, verses 3 and 4, it says here, for, um, it says, for the, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authorities? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, then be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And that's, unfortunately, today we have a lot of evil that's being practiced. And that uh, he's talking about here the, the, the government and the sense of our laws uh, that are out there to protect the people. And he basically just says here that, that if you uh, are doing good, then, then you shouldn't have to fear uh, the, the judgment. But if you are doing evil, then he says, you know, to do what is good and you will have praise from the same. So if you're doing good, then you have nothing to worry about. Right? You have nothing to worry about. You're going to be praised. Hey, good citizen, law-abiding. But if you do bad, then yeah, you should have something to fear. There should be some consequences for your actions. And so again, it just goes back to uh, capital punishment. I know a lot of people may have their own opinion on it, but you know, I, you know, I go to the Word of God. I go to the Word of God, and and really just leave it to the Lord because that's that's God. He's a judge. He's you know, He puts people in positions where we trust their judgment. But at the same time. You know, we get to vote these things into law. We get to vote, and a lot of this stuff comes on the ballot. And we have to to really. I know we, we have a conscience and we have conviction, but we have to look to the Word of God too and put the two together, right, to make the best decision for for our future. And so, um, again, this this talks about capital punishment. It says here, but if if he did not lie in wait, if a man acts with Premeditation. You see, this is what we're talking about, premeditation. And what is the issue? The issue is clearly one of premeditation and treachery. What does that mean? Well, God did not place crime of passion or neglect of the same plan as crime of premeditation and tre treachery. So, do you want to explain that, babe? Well, I, it, I think the verse, uh, verse 14, but if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take from him my altar that he may die. So basically, um, if you premeditate, you know, I'm Cain and Abel. What kind of crime was that? Is that a crime of passion? 
taking a deep breath to meditate. You know, if you think about it, when he called his brother out into the field, it could have fallen into premeditation. But I look at that, and what does God do? Mm. He puts a mark on, on Cain, and he allows him to live, but he lived as a marked man for the rest of his life. And this altar, this distance from God, no propitiation for sins, no peace offering, no mm. offense offering, nothing. There is nothing that you can offer in exchange. In exchange for somebody else's life. For somebody else's life. So what do you do with Cain? What do you do with David? Definitely premeditated and dirty. Yeah, we, we sure uh, Uriah. Um, but this is God's way of saying, hey guys, I want you to fear death. I want you to have the fear of losing your own life or taking somebody else's and being evil and not considering those who I love. I love you. And you should be afraid to touch or harm any of my creation, any. Mm. And that's the picture that God is putting here, mm. that we should love one another so much that we would love people as much as we love ourselves so that if we don't want to be murdered, we shouldn't murder. Mm. Yeah. If we don't want to be slandered, we shouldn't slander. Yeah. If we don't want to be envied, we shouldn't envy. And I just think the biggest one of all, and I think Cain says it, Please, please let not your presence go from before me. Please. But here, when you take the altar, the forgiveness, the presence, the peace, the communion, the peace offering that allows you to have communion with the temple, the priest, and your fellow man, your brothers and sisters, all wiped out, mm. all gone. So in essence, you're an isolated being without redemption. Mm. And that's when you take the altar. Yes. So. Yes, and that, and that, and just to, to support what Laura was sharing, is that that altar, the principle of punishment, murderers, is so important to God, as Laura was sharing, mm -hmm. uh, that he, he denied murderers, refugees, uh, at his altar. And that's that's kind of what what it means. Um, in in the book of Numbers, chapter thirty five, verse thirty one, and verses thirty three and thirty four, God says also that unpunished murderers defiled the land. He says, moreover, you shall take no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death. But he shall surely be put to death. So shall not put so shall uh, so you shall not pollute the land where you are for blood defiles the land and no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed on it except by blood by the blood of him who shed it now i don't know if you've ever read that i don't know if you've ever heard that before but that is some <laughs> crazy stuff right i mean god is saying like blood is, you know, you take a take a man's life, that blood stains that land. The only the only way that 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 um, land becomes pure is, you know, is if if it's uh, by your blood. It says, "So you shall not pollute the land where you are, for blood defiles the land, and no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it." Therefore, do not defile the land which you inhabit, in the midst of which I dwell, for I, the Lord, dwell among the children of Israel. And this is, again, found in Numbers chapter 35, verses 31, 33 through 34. And this is biblical. And this is the way, this, this, is, the, uh, this is how God felt about murder, especially when it comes to first-degree murder, premeditated murder. And we've had our fair share of, of those experiences in, in the United States. You have some big cases that have been um, that have been out there because of first degree murder. Some people have gotten off, but they think they've gotten off, but God sees everything. Um, I think one of the biggest murders I remember when I first started learning about the Bible, my biggest beef was how dare David take Uriah's life? I mean, I was riveted, like, no, like, how is it that such a righteous man like Uriah is able to 
to be murdered and David go off and be not held <laughs> to this law. Um, and you know, I remember reading in Romans and he just brought it back to my remembrance as I'm sitting here listening to this. It says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is God, and basically he was saying, hey Lord, so do you think that I'm unrighteous for forgiving David and, and not giving him his due reward? And I was mm. thinking like, yeah, you know, here he has a whole kingdom. He's got all these women. He's got this awesome man who's out there on the battle fighting for him and he backstabs him, betrays him and takes his wife. I'm like, yeah, stone the guy. Like take him out, God. And then then God, then then this is in Romans 9:15. And it just pierced me. I just thought, gosh, Lord, help me. I I, I just I have this thing with why did he have to kill Uriah? But what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then, it is not for him who wills, no, for him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all of the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. Oh, so you say, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Why does God still find fault there? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing that formed it say to the thing that formed him, why have you made me like mm. this? Does not the potter have the power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God wanting to show his wrath to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. And that's who Paul was. Mm. He was a murderer. Paul killed by the order and by his order, very much like David. Well, and Moses as well. I mean, here we are. Very, very much season. like David, also murdered. And I just think, here we go, God. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. Has God had mercy on you? And you're holding on to all of this anger and pain like <laughs> like I did with David. I couldn't believe it. I was like, I was mad. I was like, no, that's just that's just wrong. And um, that he might make known the riches of his glory uh, uh, on the vessels of mercy. If you've been forgiven for something so treacherous, even as yeah. murder, or you're carrying around the guilt of murder, manslaughter by accident, or whatever it is, God says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will use you, you vessel of mercy. Are you a vessel of mercy? It says here, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he called, not the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. He says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people and they shall be called the sons of the living God. Have you ever felt like you are not the people of God? You don't deserve forgiveness. You know, the biggest thing that could happen to anybody, even in the Old Testament, Testament is the altar being taken away. Well, Jesus Christ is our sacrificing lamb. But the altar, at the end of the day, when he uses the vessel, was a vessel which God demonstrates his mercy. But, yeah, just I just thought I'd yeah. touch on those things. <laughs> and that, that kind of leads me to verse 13, because verse 13 deals with, um, let's say, second-degree murder. So, uh, you know, this deals with mercy, period. First, second, third. Uh, and can God forgive a murderer? Yes, he can. Will God forgive a murderer? Yes, he can. 
But it doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer the consequences of your actions. There's a lot of men in prison right now that have been forgiven by God. They will go to heaven, but they still have to, um, you know, they still have to suffer the consequences for their actions. David paid dearly in prison. And yes, and so in verse 13 he says, "However, if you did not lie in wait, so this is second degree murder." He says, "I will." If you did not lie in wait, but God delivered him in, into into His hands, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. So, so what does that mean? So this is this is talking about the second degree murder, and we see in Numbers again, chapter thirty-five, and also Joshua twenty, that God commanded Israel to make cities of refuge, a place where he may flee, and we see that in verses uh, in Joshua chapter twenty, it says. The Lord also spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge, where, where I spoke to you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer that kill any person unaware or un unwittingly may flee there, and they shall be your refugee for, from the avenger of blood. And when he that uh, does flee unto one city, one of those cities shall stand at the in, stand at the entering of the gate of the city and shall declare his cause in the ears of the elders of that city they shall take him into the city and give him a place that he may dwell amongst them and if he and if the avenger of blood pursues after him then they shall not deliver the slayer up to, into his hands because he made because he smote his his neighbor unwittingly and hated him not before time and he shall dwell in the city until he stands before the congregation and the for the judgment and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days and then shall the slayer return and come unto his own city and unto his own house unto the city from uh, whence he fled and they appointed Kadesh in uh, Galilee in Mount Naphtali and Shechem in Mount Ephraim and Ker, uh, Ker, uh, Ker, Kerjak uh, which is Hebron in the Mount of Judah so so they, these are the designated areas where they provided that place of refuge and there's a lot of them yeah um, but that's that's kind of you know dealing with uh, second degree murder unwittingly un uh, unintended and uh, God provides a place where they can flee in case of manslaughter where they can be protected until the case was properly heard or handled. And so we move on to verse 15 through 17, and that deals with the law concerning murder of parents. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a sad day because, I mean, this stuff happens all the time. You would think, who would want to murder their parents? I mean, there, there was a case, I think, when I was younger about the two brothers. Men Melendez? The, the Men Menendez, Menendez brothers who murdered their parents for, for their money. You know, that's why we don't have any money, so we, you know, we don't have to worry about that with our kids. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're just going to spend it all. But um, it happens It happens a lot. You know, these kids want to kill off their parents early so they can get their, their inheritance. Um, and uh, so it tells us very, uh, very clearly, and Laura touched on this, uh, it says, He who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. And he who kidnaps a man and sells him or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. And he who, who uh, curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. I mean, this is just disrespect. You disrespect your parents, man, you get stung. Uh, you know, we, well, it's, it's interesting how, how there's a commandment to parents for um, murder and then for dishonor. God, the hierarchy that God wanted in the family was parents to be respected and, and to be honored and to be honored and it doesn't say in the bible that parents are honorable it doesn't say that it's a given that parents should be honorable to their children but here god is specifically keeping order in the home when you have a, a disrespectful child or an a, smack that brother a very um I'm just playing. <laughs> a, a very strong-willed child. Even God wanted that order to be kept. And there's different parents who may be out there who are softer and 
don't discipline their children. But here children were afraid of their own society, that if they were even watched, yep. the elders of that city could take that child stone outside the gates and stone that child. So that child didn't just have fear of his own parents taking him out. That child had fear from an entire society by which he lived in. And I just, I try to wrap my head around that. I'm thinking like, oh my, you know, but also the parents had the responsibility to provide and to be there for and that child them. and parent them. And back then, um, having a family unit in an honorable way of being married and staying together hmm. was also revered. So the, um, the construct of the family, the expectation of the man providing for the woman, the expectation of there being a family unit for the purpose of industry, for the purpose of um, survival, for the purpose of representing God. Representing God, it was all intact. We basically disintegrated that today. It it almost is. You look around; it's almost non-existent. We have people living with each other, just having sex, having children out of wedlock. It's the norm. But we're, we're, there's no conviction anymore. There's no conviction, but in these times, God re it's a it was a reset because yeah, these times you didn't abort your baby. Well, you could. Well, yeah, you did. You yeah, take well, them to Molik yeah, and you put them on the fire. It was yeah, different. I mean, you did with. deliver the child, and then you. It, it, what's the difference? Is now that the child born is born, is he a, a child? Is a child whether it's inside your womb or outside your womb. It's a child. The baby's been conceived. But here, um, it, it's just interesting to me that God knew that if the line of honor was disrespected on the parental aspect, that society as a whole mm -hmm. would be disrespectful and it would be ruined. Um, yeah. And the whole society protected that honor um, in that time. And that's how God was setting the children of Israel apart. He took them from polygamy. He took them from having several gods. He from took Moloch. them... He took the children from being disrespectful and putting order in. He took all that, you know, and um, and that's important that we know God's hierarchy of order and respect. We've lost it, um, mm -hmm. and I just think it's it's um, it, it shows our society too. has lost it, and I think we're living in a generation. We're dealing with the effects um, of of that. I, I was one of those kids. I I could have been stoned in a sense because I disrespected my parents I didn't I grew up without uh, broken home and once my father left for home and it was feast or famine it was you know it was a smorgasbord my mom really was just trying to survive there was no way she did it she did the best she could but you know I was, I was 12 years old I was becoming a teenager and I just became a re rebellious um, and, and you know again a child left to its own will bring his mother shame and now again, I know she did the best she could, but trying to trying to take care of herself and yet having three kids and going through a divorce, it was tough for her. And so um, we pretty much got to do whatever we wanted to do. And that was the '80s, so you can think about the '80s, right? You had disco, you had you had all these 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 uh, little clubs going on. The, the you had the the cofetes going on. You had the house parties, and we were I mean we were out there just rebellious uh, dance party. Uh, crazy young teenagers that were just indulging in our flesh. And so, yeah, I could have been stoned. Well, then we're, well, that's what's called we're a vessel of mercy. You know, it's God will not, have And mercy. not because I murdered somebody, but because I, because of the disrespect and because of the cursing and because, you know, because, uh, and you hear our kids today, you go to the, the high schools and I go, I go to the high schools and the cursing of these kids, it's like part of their vocabulary. There's no conscience at all. But it's also a social norm, right? It's not even offensive anymore. People use it as flippant um, vocabulary. Yeah. It's it's okay. It's accepted in society now, and that's the difference. God was saying, "Hey, yeah. this is not accepted, and this is not okay." But it all started. And but it all started with the little bit, you know, the little acceptance led to more acceptance. A little bit of love led to the whole up, and um, I think that what we've done, especially because of where we come from. You know, for our home, we we've kind of made that stand to say, you know what, no, it's not going to happen here. Now you have that opportunity, parents, in your home, to make that decision. You have that opportunity to take back your house and to bring in these biblical values into your home. <laughs> I'm going to stone you, no? Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
go outside. Take you out the gates well, of the city. I mean, there's a lot no. of rocks out here. You know, we can have <laughs> yeah. some stonies in the backyard. You know, yeah. I'm just playing. Um, okay. No, but just, but there's ways to deal with it to where you get your kids to actually respect you. You know, we have a 21 year old and a 23 year old, and you know, I our sons never curse. You know, never okay. they've never cursed at us. My they daughter, may be really angry. <laughs> they may have been angry, but never cursed at us. My daughter is 21 years old. She's never, you know, she's never cursed at us. I think she got crazy like one time, but not at us. She was just cursing, uh, you know. You know, freshmen when they go to college, they think, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they well, could. Well, they find a whole new <laughs> acceptance whole new, of vocabulary. Yeah, in college, you can do everything, common. right? You, you know, and as parents, you pay for the college, but you can't check on their grades. You can't. So they, they, they think they become independent. But, you know, I remember one time she came home and uh, out of the blue, she started cursing. And we were just like, whoa, where did that come from? That's not you. And, um, you know, we got to put a little smack on that mouth, and that's what we need to do. But our kids, never, they knew that we, we don't talk that way. And that was also coming from us, too. Like, we never you know, use curse words at them. There's a proper way to conduct our conversations. And that all came from biblical values. We, we, we even though uh, they were our kids, they weren't beneath us per se, but we respected them as kids. And, you know, we raised them, but we also didn't talk to them or belittle them, um, you know, as, you know, we, we respected them. And in that, they respected us. So it, it's been one of those things. Um, so it's very, very important. It says, he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. And this is, that's to do with kidnapping. Kidnapping was also considered a capital offense. In the eyes of God, criminal, uh, criminally enslave, uh, enslaving a man was not far from murdering him. And we have not only kidnapping, but we have a lot of, um, what happens when you, when you sell, when you're selling people? Oh, um, human trafficking. Human trafficking. I mean, there's, right now, there's, I mean, human trafficking is crazy, right? So there's a lot of this stuff going on. And again, it all goes back to whenever you take the Bible out of your out of your society, whenever you take the Word of God out of your home, what are the standards? You know, some of the things that you see on TV even now going on, it's kind of like, where, where, are the, where are the morals in our society? I can't believe that we're even talking about this kind of stuff. I can't even believe that people think this way. But it, but it was then too, right? It was then too. I mean, there was a horrible things going on that God well, was saying, hey, don't do this anymore. Well, I think, Stop it. I think that right here, right here, like Laura was sharing, because they just came out of Egypt, God is, it's kind of a fresh start for them. Mm -hmm. So God is saying, listen, these are the standards that, you know, going forward, now that we're out of, you know, in slavery, and it's kind of like, you know, now we're coming out of this COVID-19, there's kind of some, some new standards on, on how we ought to live, you know, laws and stuff that we ought to follow. But um, at the same time, you know, this is what I'm saying is that you and your family, you can, you can do this to your house. You can bring this into your home. But here's the thing. You have to live it too. You know, one of the things is that my mom, you know, I love her, but sometimes she would say something but not do it. You know, so, uh, you know, your kids, they don't want this, you know, do as I say, not as I do. You have to live it. You're the biggest testimony in their life. If you're cursing at their mom, but yet you're telling them not to curse, you know, then they're going to look at you and they're going to see hypocrite all over the place. And they're going to hold you accountable for that. They may not ever say anything to you, but once they become an adult, that they're, they're not going to want nothing to do with you. And so, you know, this is vital. So what you need to do is tame your tongue, tame your attitude, tame your anger, learn how to properly speak, educated, right? Um, not ignorant, uh, you know, and practice all the things that we learn biblically. Think before you speak, um, before you act out. Again, Jesus took murder to a whole other level. This is an act of murder, but Jesus takes it again to the intent, to the heart of murder. Uh, you know, so uh, we go back to the, he who curses his father and his mother shall surely be put to death. And what is the idea? The idea is of an adult child who threatens their parents. Through this law, you know, we see here, it preserves, like Laura Shane, it preserves a critical foundation for civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, respect between generations. And a lot of young people don't respect the elders. We've lost a lot of that respect. You know, we, have you ever heard of the term respect your elders? See, that's the kind of stuff that I, I grew up with. When my parents were married, I, you know, respect your elders. I would hear that all the time, and I did. But the minute my parents got divorced, I lost all respect for people in general. So this is, you know, a way to keep that that foundation and to keep a civilized society. And as crazy as we have been as America, because we have some of these foundational laws, it, it really has kept our society. I mean, we can go outside and not necessarily fear to be murdered. I mean, yeah, it happens, but 
I feel pretty safe in my community. You know, we have a great police force. Um, I feel my wife can go for a walk. She can go for a run. Normally we do it together, but I don't, you know, I, you know, I think our kids today, um, there's a lot of disrespect, a lot of cursing, but honestly, we have wimpy kids today. I'm, I'm sorry to say that. They're just wimpy. Um, they're afraid of their own shadow. Um, but before, in the neighborhood, I mean, you had gangster kids where they didn't care. They'll shoot you. Uh, they'll stab you. Um, they didn't care. Uh, nowadays, you know, we just have kids that are afraid to come out of their house, and they're gamers. Um, they're into technology. So they're, 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 they're just into all the social media stuff. They're virtual warriors. <laughs> I mean, nowadays you get bullied online. I mean, it's like our kids, you know, they're cutting themselves. They're, you know, all depressed because they can't handle persecution. They're, you know, somebody says something bad about them and they got to go feel sorry. It's just sad, the kids that we have today. Um, there's, no, there's no mental toughness at all. But here's the deal. You know, this, this protected that, that society. Um, it also has the uh, built-in protection for the rights of the child, according to Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 18 to 21. And it says, if a man has, has a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not, will, uh, will not hearken unto them, then his father and his mother lay hold of him and bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gates of his place and they shall say unto the elders of the city this this our son is stubborn and rebellious he will not obey our voice he is uh, he is glutton and he is a drunkard and all the men of the city shall stone him with stones then he then he died then he will die so shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and shall fear. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, we have these single moms, and they raise these, these young boys, and these young boys, they grow up like this. They don't, they don't respect. They, they're stubborn. They're they, they, get in, they get in alcohol and drugs, and it's like, what do you do with them? Well, you know, they grow older, and they really don't change. They become more of a menace to society. And so what do, you, what do they do? They say, hey, look, you're going to be evil. We're just going to take you out. You're no good. You're, you're, you, know, uh, you become a, a dead weight. And so they would just take them out, and the elders would stone them. A glutton, meaning a glutton. that he you was know, eating, <laughs> eating their, them out of house and home and doing no work, no good, nothing, you know, a no lazy... Good. Glut when I think of a glutton, I think of somebody who's out of shape, large in size, lethargic, and slow to move. So um, a, a glutton. And so this fear says, "Hey, parents, um, you don't have you don't have the right to carry out this punishment." But they had to bring this accused child before the elders and the judge of the city, so that way that child, you know, had a, at least an option, and the elders would make that decision. This meant that the parents. Uh, against all contempt, uh, all the customs of the day, uh, have the absolute power of life and death over their child. As a practical matter, the judge of Israel rarely even ever administered the death penalty in such cases. Yet the children was held accountable, and that's really what it comes down to, guys. And, and you know, I know we were going through this, and you think, man, that's harsh, but not really. It's accountability. You see, our kids need accountability. And when, when they don't have accountability, again, a child left to itself will bring its mother shame. How many of our, our parents are both working and, and leaving the kid to raise himself? And he's going on social media and he's all of this stuff. I mean, you, you know, you, you may not, you, you may not, you may think your kids are, are angels, but they're into, they're, I'm sure they're into pornography. I'm sure they're into some, some stuff on social media that you don't even know about. That's just how crazy it is. And so having that accountability, going into your kid's room. Um, you know, we always went and checked up on our kids. We went into their rooms, <laughs> went really through their mad. drawers. Um, <laughs> you know, as long as you're living in our house. And I know it sounds like, wow, you know, that's harsh. But no, there's accountability. And with that accountability, guess what? Comes product, uh, productability, right? Comes production out of their life. Then they become an asset to society. Then they bring in the mannerism into their workplace, into their house, and into their marriage. They know, you know, they know the difference between loyalty and unloyalty, faithfulness and unfaithfulness. And mm -hmm. guess what happens? When they see you guys doing it and they are held accountable to that higher standard, you, you raise that, if you bring that bar low, guess what? Your kid will achieve it. You got to raise the bar of your standards. And that's really what the Lord is saying. Hey, we got some standards going forward. We're going to raise the bar. We're out of Egypt now. You know, we're better than that. And these are your standards. And so, um, you know, the, these were very important comp 
these are very important laws and um, you know respecting the elders of the generation as they grow older and it is at the mercy of the younger generation and if that younger generation is allowed to carry open warfare on the older generation then the very foundation of, of a society are shaken and you know we always got to respect our elders and, and that's something that um, you know as I got more mature as I got more older myself I started to realize how much we need our elders uh, I started to look back and think about my grandmother and you know just all the stuff that she went through I mean my grandmother raised my grandmother raised, she had, uh, she had two daughters who were prostitutes, okay? Two daughters who were prostitutes. And she raised their kids. I mean, my grandmother died at 60 years old because she was so overwhelmed with raising everybody else's kids. Whenever we went to visit her, those kids cussed at her. Those kids would jump out of the windows. Those kids would bring drugs into the house. They'd bring alcohol into the house. Now, now those kids are in prison. They've been divorced multiple times. Um, a couple of them are doing well, but she raised probably about six or seven of her kids' kids. And, you know, I made a promise at a very young age that I would not do that to my mother. And, you know, and today, my mother raises two boys who her sister was a prostitute and she got pregnant and she was on drugs she was on and so she delivered these boys premature and they had defects one's in a wheelchair can't walk um and they they have um what do they have babe cerebral palsy. Cerebral, cerebral palsy i mean so my mom literally spent her whole grandmother life becoming a mother again and now these boys are 16 17 and they're awesome they're awesome praise god yeah, she's doing the work of the lord but it stemmed from this this young girl who they're was supposed to be boys. they're great boys they're because boys. because of my mother but this, you know, her sister that, that was out there prostituting her body didn't care what she was doing. And that was, and she has like 11 kids out there somewhere, you know, and um, in foster homes. And, you know, we have 6,000 kids in our foster communities. It's like, it's so sad, but here's the reality. You know, if we, 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 when we take out the biblical aspects of what God is saying out of our home, you see the fibers of our society have gone to ruin. And, but you know, when I look at that, it brings me, um, I look at people like Paul, um, people like David. A vessel of mercy is so profitable because you are able, me, myself, and you also are a vessel of mercy. We've been saved from such miry pits of clay. And God says to us, nothing is irredeemable. But yet there are these standards so that when we start to read them and we're like, whoa, we didn't know this existed. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that God held love for others in such high regard because we don't get to see it. And frankly, if I was given away and I was a, a foster child, who cares? Who loves me? Who am I going to love? I was never taught to love, you know, and and it makes me very emotional. Mm -hmm to think about, you know, when, uh, I mean, even honestly, like this man did not know how to love. He didn't, he thought he did, <laughs> but he didn't. I myself had to learn, I'm like, teach us. Because in society, <coughs> we don't well, know what that love looks yeah, like. And I, I, it isn't until yeah. we found the Lord and exactly. and First Corinthians chapter 13, we're like, oh shoot, and, and we're doing may, it all wrong. And, and here's the deal, you may be dealing with the same thing. You may be, you know, thinking that, your your love is is you know that you're loving, but it may not be necessarily the right type of love. Yeah, he thought he was loving. I'm like, oh no, that is absolutely not loving. <laughs> I was like, woman, bring me my food. I'm loving you, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was too. You know, being a child of God <laughs> has its definite benefits. You get blessed, but you also get corrected. So God has a way of, of chasing His children, and that's part yeah. of you know what. We're, you know, we're, we're learning here. Um, I thank God for his chastening. But, you know, Laura's right. Um, you know, we, we love naturally because of caring for your family and what have you. But there, there, there's a lot of selfishness in that love. When you look at the biblical mm -hmm. love, when you look at the agape love, when you look at, you know, those types of love, um, it really puts a new, uh, it really helped me, especially if you want to be like Christ, especially if you want to follow the Lord. And, um, you know, in First Corinthians 13, right, it talks about the, the love. You know, love is kind, love is patient, 
love is not envy, love is not provoked. And when you really look at that, it's like, wow, you know what? My love is very selfish. I love you because I, I get something back, you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and and I had to learn, and I'm still learning. I'm not saying, I'm, you know, we're not there yet, obviously, but you we know, won't be there. <laughs> we won't be there on this but side of heaven, a, but it's a beautiful thing when, when you can, journey. when you can, uh, can demonstrate that love and, um, and not be afraid to, to get hurt. Um, because even in your getting yeah. hurt, if your love is genuine, then that love shouldn't be affected. You know, I think about Christ's love, and man, for him to love the way he did literally killed him. It literally killed him. So when you have difficult people that you know you've got to love in your, your mind and your anger because they've been mean to you, it's like you literally have to die because it hurts to be kind or to show them any mercy. And God knows that. Hmm. God knows that. So <clears throat> in marriage, it works. Yeah. It works with colleagues. It works. But man, it, it literally feels like it, it kills you. Um, so sometimes I think about Christ when things are really hard to do or say. And I think like, Lord, have mercy on me and, and teach teach us how. Teach us, teach us the way on... Um, even, even yours, I don't want the altar taken from me. I don't want the altar of forgiveness to be taken from me. Why would I want it to be taken from anybody? Um, but yet here we see it. An altar can be taken from someone who mm. has premeditation. Who And premeditation means that you're thinking of evil continuously. Continuously you're thinking of how to plot. You've got so much anger. You've got so much pain and so much dissent. And, and basically, God says, look, you've been thinking about this for a long time. I'm going to take my altar from you. I'm going to take that forgiveness from you. And it's here. And that's the scariest thing, mm -hmm. to not be able to, to harden so hard. You know, Pharaoh had over 10 opportunities to relent, but he didn't. It was at the very last one that God said, fine, I'm going to harden your heart. And now you stay there. You stay there as a hard vessel of my wrath and there you go yeah um and again we may not physically do the act of murder but maybe in your heart you have you have that ill will towards somebody uh, because of something that has happened to you um and and, and don't get me wrong there, there's some stuff that that you that people have been through um and you guys you know have, have done a great job at overcoming it but it's still there and you 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 still have that anger you know, for that person, um, I think for me, the, you know, the the for me to forgive my father was probably yeah. the, probably one of the most um, set free um, decisions I made in my life when I had so much anger um, and maybe even murder in my heart because of, of him leaving us, um, some of the things that he did um, to our family. Uh, you know, I'm a very loyal person because of that, and um, I take relationships I think we take um, I take my marriage my children um, very very serious in loyalty um, but when a father betrays you when a family member betrays you it, it, it's 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 just another level of and so but we can carry this murder in our heart we can have this ill will or when we get robbed or somebody rips us off um, or someone does us wrong uh, especially when you come from the neighborhood you know in the streets there's it, it's you have your own justice and you deal with it your own way but now, you know, as a Christian, um, you know, we bring it to the Lord, and the Lord is going to carry out that justice. The Lord is going to deal with it. Uh, and um, so I want to encourage you guys to, you know, just continue to trust in the Lord with even those feelings and those pains and allow Him to do what He does. I mean, obviously, these are set by God. So God has a standard, and, you know, God's going to go ahead and deal with, with those individuals. Here you have some comments from Daniel, Martha, and then... Um Ada, yes, it does feel like it kills you. Help us, Lord. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and yeah, and da Daniel uh, and Martha have a good point. Daniel and, Martha. Yeah, Daniel Martha, and uh, and and he says here that when you the Bible says bring your child in, uh, or yeah bring him up in the ways of the Lord, and as they as they grow older, they will not depart from him, and that's and that is that's true, and that's kind of what I was sharing about. You know, one of the things that we did. If you want to ask what we did different, that's what we did different. Um, you know, we raise them up in the ways of the Lord. And what are the ways of the Lord? And that's what you got to find out. That's what you got to go to church for. That's what you got to be in your word for. And those ways are of love. Those ways are of forgiveness. Those ways are of reading them these things. 
um, reading them the Word of God, you know, and um, having that devotional time with your kids, uh, spending that time with your kids, you know, and even though my daughter is home from college now, and my wife and her are reading books together, you know, and they're con- and so they'll spend time together. You know, I've done things with my son as an adult, constantly pouring into their life. And so, uh, uh, yes, thank you, Daniel, for that. Um, let's see. Olivia, Olivia Romo. Roman, a blessing. Romo. Yeah, uh, Romo, yes. Blessings. May our Lord ab- abundantly bless you both and your families abundantly in Jesus. Amen. Amen. And you know what God has. Hi, Olivia. God has. God has blessed us tremendously. And, 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 the, and that's all we want to be is really a blessing to to you guys um, kind of give you what God's given to us we don't it's not, it hasn't been perfect there's been a lot of pain a lot of hurt but God has turned that into good and so um, and we have Brian um, Brian Brian Can- uh, Cannon. Cannon good morning, good morning Brian. Brian yes and Connie, Connie and, and Efren. Efren good morning family good morning John and Lydia yes uh, uh, amen uh, Ada yeah. good morning so you see here, uh, Daniel, that's what we used to do. Uh, thank the Lord. Amen for his guidance. Yes. Um, and, and you know what? We're, we're seeing a shift in our society. I think with this COVID-19, you know, a lot of parents have had to deal with their kids. Um, one of the things that we've lost is that we've kind of pawned our, you know, and I know it's tough. Kids are active. They want to run around and we just want to pawn them off on somebody to take care of them. But just know that when you pawn them off on people, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You don't know what they're teaching them. And a lot of our schools, we, we love it. We just want to give them the school, let them go to school from seven till two or three. And that's seven hours, seven you know, or eight hours that you're not influencing your kids. You know, and in that, um, you know, that's important. You know, the influence that, that, that you allow to pour into those kids. And, uh, and that's part of what Daniel was talking about, raising them up in the ways of, of the Lord. 